Welcome to the Real Python Podcast. This is episode 201. What are the benefits of using a decoupled data processing system? And how do you write reusable queries for a variety of backend data platforms? This week on the show, Philip Cloud, the lead maintainer of IBIS, will discuss this portable Python data frame library. Philip contrasts IBIS's workflow with other Python data frame libraries. We discuss how getting close to the data speeds things up and conserves memory. He describes the different approaches IBIS provides for querying data and how to select a specific backend. We discuss ways to get started with the library and how to access example data sets to experiment with the platform. Philip discovered IBIS while looking for a tool that allowed him to reuse SQL queries written for a specific data platform on a different one. He also recounts how he got involved with the IBIS project, sharing his background in open source and learning how to contribute to a first project. This episode is sponsored by MailTrap, an email delivery platform that developers love. Try for free at MailTrap.io. All right, let's get started. The Real Python Podcast is a weekly conversation about using Python in the real world. My name is Christopher Bailey, your host. Each week, we feature interviews with experts in the community and discussions about the topics, articles, and courses found at realpython.com. After the podcast, join us and learn real-world Python skills with a community of experts at realpython.com. Hey, Philip. Welcome to the show. Hey. Hey, Chris. Great to be here. Yeah, yeah. So Wes, Wes McKinney hooked us up to talk a little deeper about IBIS. I mentioned multiple times that I'm very interested in that project, and we had so much other things to talk about when he came on. Yep. So he gave me your name and kind of showed me not only the things happening with the project, but you have a detailed like YouTube channel going there, which I think is nice. But maybe we can start with this. Like, how did you get involved with IBIS to begin with? Yeah, so in 2016, I was working at, uh, well, it's now called Meta, Facebook then. Yeah. And I was I was in data engineering. The job there is, that job there anyway, is, is like, it's writing a lot of SQL code. Okay. And Facebook has a dizzying array of infrastructure. Data engineering deals mostly with Hive, uh, or at least at the time, it was mostly Hive. Presto was like sort of the new kid on the block. And it was getting a lot of internal, like, sort of hype and use and and whatever. Hive was, like, super hard to use uh, for building a pipeline. Because okay. when you're working with, uh, like, a data engineering pipeline, you often are iterating, right? You don't know necessarily exactly what your code is going to look like right away. So you need something that's going to give you somewhat reasonable feedback, a somewhat reasonable feedback loop. Like, you're not going to be waiting, like, 30 seconds to run, you know, account star query or something like that. Okay, yeah. So you just to kind of break it down even a little bit more there, like when you talk about pipelines, I'm guessing there's a variety. They could be the like ingestion of data pipeline, but there also could be like just the transformation layer sort of stuff. Like, Yeah, I mean, I can, I can give you kind of a whirlwind tour of how this whole system worked. Basically, at, like all of Facebook's apps like sort of emit data at some probably alarming rate um, and it's it's <laughs> yeah. going into into a message bus which is essentially like a giant queue right it's just like a bunch of like in memory things the apps are all kind of forwarding the data through this pipe and then that pipe splits off into like a bunch of different things so okay you can sort of hook into that pipe with php and do like arbitrary programmatic transformations you can run like streaming sql on that you can, or you can just kind of write it directly to Hive. In that case, okay, it would go into essentially a file system using Facebook's file format called Dwarf, which is a derivative of another file format called Orc. Okay, and then our job. <laughs> I love the names. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, they're they're uh, they're they're funny names. Um, and yeah. and so once they hit disk, data engineers could start building transformations and and then those transformations would of course be like written to a disk somewhere else into another table and there's this just gigantic you know directed graph of of like 
each transformation and you know being run daily effectively okay and that that's sort of how the whole thing works so basically our what we did was write a lot of very complicated select statements um okay yeah we were almost never writing like insert or create table that was automatically done by other processes okay you needed to pull information out in some categorical things like you know like narrow it in some way yeah yeah just sort of whatever we were whatever sort of things we wanted to know about the product uh, i worked on the search the facebook search product okay that's sort of yeah we would i don't know we did a bunch of different stuff a lot of counting stuff a lot of summing stuff not a lot of like super fancy math or anything like that but a lot of sort of how are people moving throughout the app that kind of thing yeah okay yeah and so sorry let's i your original question okay. how i got involved in ibis yeah, yeah. Well, you were doing all this like really intense stuff with SQL. Yeah. And having lots of these statements and then having not wanting to necessarily run it across everything. Maybe you want like an early return of like, what is this going to even look like? Is that is that kind of where you were headed? Yeah, totally. So you could access the data from either Hive or Presto. And the thing with Hive is that Hive is built on this like idea, like it's originally built on Hadoop. And it was a way of turning SQL statements into MapReduce jobs. And okay. MapReduce is what is like a technology that is designed to survive the apocalypse, right? Nothing will take it down. <laughs> okay. And that was largely the case. And the trade-off is, is that while it, while the apocalypse, you know, may not end hive, you may not be able to get an answer to your immediate question in any sort of like interactive amount of time. Okay. Uh, yeah. Presto was designed to like m- minimize that the the trade off there. Okay. And being able to scale to sort of Facebook scale as well as like give you back interactive queries where possible, or give you back give you interactive speed where possible. And the dialects were not were not the same, right? So Hive has its thing. It's like its own SQL dialect, and then Presto has its own SQL dialect. And so I wanted a way to like write something, some code, Python preferably <laughs> sure that i could write it sort of once and then i could like when i wanted it to go to production i could just say hey like give me the hive sql for that and when i'm like interactively you know when i'm like iterating on an analysis like run it against presto okay and so i started looking around for that and then i i saw i saw what west was doing with ibis and i was like this looks like the thing that i kind of want all right so that's that's sort of how i got involved okay so you saw it being demonstrated by wes in some capacity yeah, I think it's been, a, you know, it's been almost 10 years. And so I don't remember exactly how I, like the exact sort of causal chain of how I got there. But, uh, sure. But yeah, I, I think I saw that he had announced it maybe on his blog. And, and then I was like, oh, this is cool. It seems like exactly what I need or what I want anyway. Yeah, yeah. That sounds cool. Yeah. So then you kind of jumped in. And I, I always wonder about this sort of, uh, process of getting involved in a project and i've had a few people on talking about open source and avenues in for you know a lot of my audience is going to be beginner intermediate and then i don't know i i wonder how many advanced people i have on the show you know since we're kind of a learning website of, of python yep but it uh definitely varies but i think a lot of them wonder you know like how do i get involved in a project like that and so i wonder well, what was your experience as far as like you thought this is a interesting tool? Did you then say, "Hey, I'd like to become more involved and contribute?" Or what was the process there? By that time, I had already been actively contributing to a couple of open source projects. So, okay, I guess I can I can convey a story from when I got involved in open source, like the first time, um, and that might sure, yeah, be that's a bit... always I love that stuff because I think it's interesting for people to like, you know, give them a encouragement but also like maybe warn them if there's a potential you know things that they need to be uh, aware of yeah getting involved in this world yeah totally so i got the first the first like major open source project that i contributed to is pandas when it was it was around the like zero dot 13 release or something i mean it was okay years ago um and i was i was i was in grad school i studied neuroscience in grad school computational neuroscience and so i needed some or i wanted a pandas to do something a specific way the thing i was interested in was cross correlation Um, okay and and like 
I think Pandas at the time was doing the sort of like, there's a naive way to do it that's like very, very slow. And then there's a way using like fast Fourier transforms that, uh, to do it much faster. And so I was like, cool, I want this in Pandas. I want like this to be the cross correlation algorithm. And so, so what I did was open a GitHub issue and paste the code that I had written to do this with pandas into the issue. And I was like, here's the code. Okay. <laughs> here's how you do it. Like, accept my, co- I mean, I wasn't like demanding they accept my contribution, but I sort of, you know, I went about it in, in like, I was like, well, like, I don't know how to use this thing called GitHub. Like, how do I, right, right. What do I do? And so I was just like, I'm going to put the information out there and like, you know, hopefully somebody, is either going to say like, you know, this sucks, like do it this way or like this, you know, like, like you're doing it wrong. Here's how to do it. And so the, the community was largely like, like the community that there was very helpful. And they were like, here, you know, that's good. This isn't the way to do this, <laughs> um, like pull requests, et cetera. Um, and so I guess, I guess I would just, I would say like, if you have an idea or, or you want to contribute, you know, open a GitHub issue and, and put, put the information there. And like, if the project is going to be worth contributing to, they'll help you out and, okay. and tell you like, Hey, they'll say, Hey, this is the path. And yeah, right. Yeah, like, good. have you seen our contributing docs, et cetera, that sort of thing. Nice. Cause I think a lot of, a lot of us have, have been down a similar path where we didn't really know what we were doing. And then yeah, sure. Took, you know, we, then we did once somebody was like, you know, here's how to do it. But it's a whole other like thing, a whole other organization that's that's it's got its own, like you said, like this one happened to be a pretty friendly community and so forth. And so you never know what what's behind that for. So the it's that's kind of a, a fun way of getting in. So was it something similar with Ibis then? So with Ibis, I looked through the set, I looked through GitHub issues that Wes had created and I picked one that I thought like I understood what needed to be done. I don't remember if I I sort of asked any clarifying questions, but you know, if there's any ambiguity, it's always good, good idea to ask. And then worked on it. Uh, I think the issue was was the Postgres backend. Okay. I guess we'll get into sort of what a backend is later. But um, yeah, yeah, there's lots of backends to talk about. <laughs> yeah, and so I contributed the Postgres backend. I think as my first PR, first major PR. I don't remember if I did anything sort of smaller before that. Um, Cool. That was the first major contribution that I that I submitted. So then that kind of eventually moved into you. At this point, you're involved directly with Voltron Data, right? Yeah. So Wes and I overlapped at Two Sigma, and they were big supporters of Ibis. So we worked on some Ibis related stuff there. You know, I spent a good amount of time working on Ibis, like the open source project, in addition to doing whatever sort of know two sigma specific things we were doing there okay yeah and then i sort of dropped out of the world of python analytics tools and went to work on just something totally different like sort of rust you know real you know semi real-time like video machine learning things and that that was like rust infrastructure Um, and then i came back into the came back up for air (laughs) <laughs> into sure, the, sure. Into yeah, the, you're the, down in the lower depths there. <laughs> yeah, that was an interesting time, but uh, perhaps that's yeah, maybe for another another conversation. Yeah, we kind of hinted a little bit at you know what Ibis is, and uh, of course, I talked to Wes about it with a, a little detail. Um, we didn't have a ton of time because we were talking about lots of different stuff. Yep. But maybe we could just start with like you were interested in it because of what it could do for you in reusing your Python code with these SQL statements and not having to rewrite these things that you've created. These, you know, I worked at a bank for a while and that was a, a big job I did. I, I, uh, it was a mortgage company and they were sunsetting a platform and then yep. basically starting a new platform. And they had all these reports and all these, you know, things that they still wanted to generate in basically the same kind of style if they needed to from this old data. Yep. And so they just gave me this job of like, all right, rebuild all these reports. I'm like, do you have a schema <laughs> for the database? No. Oh boy. Okay. So it's just the raw tables. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, well, do, uh, do you know what the relationships are or whatever? Not really. I'm like, 
can you give me some existing reports that came from this thing? <laughs> and so I just reverse engineered it all. And it was my first job learning SQL oh, and, wow. and working okay. in the industry. So I was like heads down learning all this sort of stuff. So I understand the idea of like wanting to take people spend a lot of time building queries yep. and they're very, very detailed and they're, you know, they're, there's something you may want to be able to reuse. And I, I, so that's kind of interesting to me that this is maybe kind of this way in for people that are interested in a tool like this, like that they are involved in a lot of SQL stuff or, you know, maybe their business has it. But maybe we could just talk about like, you know, what's fundamentally different about what's happening with the Stata Frame library compared to like Pandas or, sure. or uh, Polars. Yeah. Yeah. So I think... There's a few fundamental differences. When you're working with pandas, whenever you take an action, like you call a method or you know you add two series or data frames together, it's happening like right away, right? So like okay, the the execute like pandas itself, well, really NumPy, but you know for purposes of this question, sure. we could just say it's pandas. Yeah, pandas is going to like you know allocate memory for the output, let's say we're adding two series together. So it's going to allocate, you know, memory, and it's going to do the addition, you know, element by element, and then fill in the allocated memory. Now let's say you do another addition. Well, that's going to do, it's going to allocate another series and then do the addition and fill it in and so forth. So like every time you're generating this like sort of tree of allocations. Okay. And each one of them is taking up its own separate space. Right. And in a way. Exactly. And then every like intermediate addition, you're kind of, you're, you're wasting memory in a sense, right? Because it's just going to be thrown away to get that final output. Sure. Okay. And with a system uh, with IBIS and the, you know, Polars has like an expression based API as well. So there's some, there's some overlap there in, in, in conceptually. Yeah. But with, with like an expression based API, you're describing, you're writing that, that addition expression, you know, A plus B plus C. And then you're, it's being compiled into something else. And in Ibis's case, it's often SQL. Okay. And then you're handing that off to the database engine, which is almost certainly not going to do, it's not going to evaluate that expression in the way I just described because it has more information about what it's going to do. Pandas, for example, doesn't know that you're doing A plus B plus C. All it sees is two series and a function call to add them together. Okay. It has no look ahead at all. Yeah, it, it can't. It, it's it can't see what the global computation is you're trying to express. Okay. Whereas a SQL database can, right? It's got the whole query available to it, so it can parse it and turn it into various more structured information, like a tree that it can then analyze and say, "Oh, I know I'm doing an addition of A, B, and C. I just need to allocate that one output array and then call the function on every element of A, B, and C at a time. I only I only do that one allocation. Okay. And so that's a big difference. So it's, I guess the way you can express that, it's like it's doing the entire computation at once. Um, it's not okay. evaluating every intermediate step. So in some ways, I've heard the term, you know, being used, especially with polars, they sometimes call it lazy evaluation. And I don't know if that's yep. the exact same terminology we're thinking of here. It's, yeah, it's, it's, so there's, there's some like specific technical details around like the difference between lazy and deferred. Okay. Lazy tends to kind of, there's like a specific, it comes from like the world of functional programming where like in a lazily evaluate, like sort of tech, you know, the, the, using the sort of technical definition, the only things that uh, are evaluated ever are the things that get used. Okay. And it's it's sort of by construction of like whatever interpreter programming language you, you're using that it will be lazily evaluated. Okay. Nowadays, people use the word lazy to mean a slightly different thing, but overlapping concept. Yeah, yeah, I was thinking that. Where you just, you're not evaluating things when you, like when you write them necessarily. Okay. Um, and so... It's such an interesting approach, the idea that you're taking the set of instructions and looking at, at, at them as a whole versus, you know, just recipe list, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. And I can see how that can create a lot of efficiency, you know, within a system like that. It can say, okay, well, we don't need to grab everything. We can grab <laughs> just what we need for this particular operation or query or what have you. So, Yeah, and, and there's just like 
decades of research kind of poured into this, into SQL databases in particular, and, you know, newer systems like DuckDB are sort of extending that tradition into the, yeah. into the analytics world and, and bringing a lot of cutting edge research and, and like deep expertise in designing these systems. This episode is sponsored by MailTrap, an email delivery platform that developers love. MailTrap is an email sending solution with industry best analytics, SMTP, and email API SDKs for major programming languages. And it includes 24 7 human support. Try it out for free at MailTrap.io. That's M A I L T R A P.io. I think that kind of leads us a little bit into this idea of construction wise, like how this library kind of a little bit thinks differently than pandas. We already mentioned some of the functionality difference, but one of the things I found fascinating on just like, all right, let me just play with this thing is it's sort of like, okay, well, what backend do you want? And I was like, oh, okay, well, that's not a choice that I had to really think about so much uh, right away. And I, I think that fundamental difference, like, is interesting. Like, what are you doing when you're choosing a backend? Like, I, the default is uh, typically DuckDB, I think. That's right. Um, yeah. I think probably for performance reasons, that's why you kind of favor it in, in some way, reasons. But maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Like, what are you doing as you're choosing this backend uh, database type tool? Yeah. So when you're, when you're choosing a backend, you're opting into some assumptions about more or less the, I guess I would say the maximum scale at which you can operate. Okay. So if you're like, I, I'm opting, I'm opting into DuckDB, let's say. And yes, we do sort of implicitly opt people into DuckDB. That's because it's, it's kind of the easiest one of our backends to get started with. It has generally, it, it has almost all of the functionality that Ibis supports. Okay. It tends to be low memory. It's, you know, parallel etc it's got all these like goodies yeah 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 and Wes so talked about that quite a bit when we yeah, were yeah exactly discussing it. yeah so and when you're opting into duckdb you're 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 saying okay duckdb has a maximum scale that it can operate at which because it's and it's by design right it's not like saying oh you know everybody needs whatever petabyte scale most people don't right and duckdb it's basically like i have data that at most fits on my hard drive, right? And if I need to go any bigger than that, you might want to choose a different backend. But if you but most people don't have a terabyte of of data that they they need to analyze. Maybe maybe now that's less true than it used to be. But well yeah, it depends. Like I feel like that's something that comes up on the show is that I I'm often talking to again, you know, these kind of beginner intermediate or people getting going yeah. and are interested in trying stuff out. And you're right, they don't have a petabyte. They don't hardly probably even have a terabyte of data and so they want to just experiment and try things out but it, it's like a lot of talk and conversations are about these like huge scale yeah. things and it's like well i want to like introduce people to the idea of it and i feel like the scaling part can come later you know and also it's also expensive to even play in that realm you know exactly yeah <laughs> yeah so i guess like one of the things that we strive for with Ibis is to make that transition as seamless as possible. So there's a lot of setup for a lot of these bigger systems like Snowflake and Spark and BigQuery and so forth. And, you know, the, the like assuming you have sort of the same data in each system, like the Ibis code shouldn't change very much. Okay. Maybe you'll have to connect to something differently. But once you have that, that same code that you wrote to do all your analysis can kind of run on on both. And and so, you know, Ibis, like, we don't really like to talk about Ibis itself scaling because it's not, right. the, the size of the data is not like a scaling factor that's super relevant for Ibis. We're, we're actually just like, hey, people have built these amazing systems. We're just going to hand you the SQL and like, we know you're going to like crush it. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. Again, it's kind of like that whole idea of it being sort of disconnected I forget decoupled, the, yeah. Yeah, the de decoupling of everything I and mean, having these sort of separate systems that that are repurposable or reusable. Yep. Which is great, you know, because that helps you also as an engineer. Like 
as you mentioned, you, you, people move around from job to job and so forth. And so it's like these tools that you're familiar with can maybe come with you and, and, and the techniques that you've developed and so forth. So that's kind of nice to have a, a system that can do that also. Yeah, totally. And like one of the reasons we might, we sort of s- support a large number of backends in addition, sometimes people just like we ask for, we, we're trying to come up with like a better, you know, more sort of, I guess, transparent rationale for implementing or support for, or not, not implementing support for a specific backend. But okay, you know, one of the reasons is so that just people who are in various like settings that they may or may not have control over can use can use the tool right like somebody might be management at some large org might be like we're using bigquery or we're using snowflake right. and like we want them to be able to use ibis and like one of the things where ibis excels is like taking your your like development code into production with like minimal code changes so that same person who has to use bigquery for production right can take a sample of that data put it in DuckDB or just like download a sample that has a parquet file from BigQuery and then on their, you know, on their whatever, their their laptop, they can sit there and do analysis with DuckDB, build that using IBIS. Right. And then run that same thing against the BigQuery backend. So all those experiments exactly. are, are going to translate. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, that seems like the the essence of data science in, in some ways. Like you kind of want to allow the data scientists a chance to be able to play with things and mess around with things and and the ability of that portability lets them you know do that in a in a circumstance where it you know less intense if you will (laughs) and less costly right like every time you run you know a query on snowflake or i mean big query has like some stuff where you can like have a fixed you know amount of compute and you just you know pay up front for that but so fancier sort of pricing models aside like it will be costly for you to run your query against all of prod yeah, yeah. you know uh, as opposed to down sampling it and then you can do whatever you want with it as many times as you want right yeah that makes sense and so that that ends up being a good and we we've heard from from our users uh, that that they do this so, what's interesting to me about this idea of adding the support or generally supporting lots of these back ends is that if I'm not calculating this right, I feel like you would normally need a bunch of third-party Python libraries to build those connections to the databases, and they don't have then a a robust like way for the data frame library to like directly connect to it. And so that's kind of why you guys are going this extra mile of like, well, we're we're gonna support the back end and like have our own connection to it as opposed to like the, it being like an additional component that has to be added in is that part of the thinking there yeah i think so the way that we do we typically for sql backends anyway there's um most of the backends have what's what's called like the i forget what the name of it is the db api which is like a okay there's a pep a python pep for this it's like a set of classes and methods and exception types that a library needs to implement if it wants to say that it's kind of Python DBA API compatible. Okay. And so we use the various like vendor libraries or open source libraries for these things. Um, you know, like Snowflake has a thing, BigQuery has a thing. Okay. You know, there's PyODBC, which we use for MS SQL and so forth. And yeah. And so we don't write the thing that encodes like you know, whatever the database protocol that sends, you know, the query and the data using the whatever MySQL wire format. We don't write that. Okay. We use off the shelf open source tools to do to handle like connections and so forth. All right. Good. Yeah. What we build is the the sort of the SQL kind of compilers that take the data frame API and turn it into the SQL code. Okay. And some of that is then the flavoring, if you will, of those different types of uh databases well funny story we used to write we used to have this sort of hybrid chimera world where some of our translation was done using sql alchemy and some of it was like handwritten like we would actually write the strings okay in the next release we've kind of gutted all of that and unified our compilers around another library called sql glot which has support for all the dialects that we use 
Okay. Like polyglot, that's, that's where the name's coming from. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's taking, we're taking our eyes expressions and then turning them into like SQL glot things. And then that turns into the correct SQL dialect. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So this is kind of like you, this is where you sort of jumped in too, in the sense that you were doing this for, you said Postgres, right? That's right. Yeah. 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 It's, yeah. You kind of mentioned there, there's these sort of approaches uh, of like, well, how are we going to handle this stuff? And one of the approaches that we talked about right away was like this idea of like, I have existing SQL commands mm-hmm. and I, I want to use these queries. And the library supports that methodology along with kind of typical data frame stuff also. Like maybe we can talk about that a little bit. Like what's the difference there? Like what's involved in running a you know, standard SQL command and what do you kind of output? Sure. So there's generally like two, I think, ways in which people use what what I'll lovingly call raw SQL. <laughs> sure, that sounds good. And uh, the first one is to run commands that don't produce any output, like creating a table. When you create a table, okay. it's just like mutating some state somewhere on disk, maybe writing the name to a catalog, and et cetera. But it doesn't, it doesn't produce anything, right? Um, it just, right. yeah, run the statement. If, you know, it's, if it runs, it runs. Otherwise, you get an exception. So that, so we have like an, we have an API that's literally called raw underscore SQL. And then you just, you give it a string and it's going to give you back like whatever the DB API would give you back. So it's pretty bare, it's pretty low level, okay. like pretty bare bones. You're kind of managing everything yourself. That's like a, that's like an escape hatch in Ibis. And just, as an aside, we have a few level, we have like a few tiers of escape hatch because people like want to do things at different, with different levels of abstraction. Sure. So raw SQL is the lowest level of abstraction. You're just like, right. Here's a SQL string. Like, do the thing that the the driver would do. Right. Okay. And then and and you can run select statements, but you're gonna be you're gonna have to manage like pulling back the the list of rows and all that stuff yourself. Okay. It's not popping back on an object of, of sorts. Yeah, it's going to give you back like some kind of capital R result thingy, or it's okay. it's sort of it's very back end specific because the drivers are necessarily returning back end specific objects. Okay. The next, I guess, level up of abs- abstraction is is like you handing the connection a, C- a select statement, so that so now like we've restricted the level like the SQL statements you can run. Because if you give us a select statement, we can actually just build an Ibis expression from that. Yeah, okay. All we need are the column names and the types, and then you've got this sort of opaque blob. It's like, this is going to be the first thing. It's a table, you know, and you can run your run your query that way. You get back a ta- an Ibis expression, like a table expression, and then you can start working with that thing as if it were just a regular old Ibis table. That's a use case where you're like, I've got a huge pile of existing SQL, bunch of select statements, and I want to I want to start like using Ibis, but like all the stuff to set up my existing tables and so forth exists. I don't want to rewrite that in Ibis yet. Okay. Maybe you do later, but you don't now. So that's that's like the dot SQL method on the on the back end object. Okay. We have one more SQL escape hatch, which is definitely our sort of like fanciest <laughs> escape hatch. Okay. And this is a SQL method on the table expression itself, where you can actually run SQL against the Ibis expression that precedes it. Okay. Which is kind of nutty, right? Like you're somehow taking this Python code and getting it into the database. And then you can mix and match too. So you can you can go into SQL and out of SQL and back into Ibis, et cetera. Okay. And that escape hatch is for the use case when Ibis doesn't have an API to do what you want, but the database has, it's something in the database you know you need. And okay. So you would use that escape hatch for, for that use case. So then the whole other approach of working with it is in much more of a data frame centric methodology. Is that right? Yep. Yep. So things sort of um i mean they i would say they look and feel pandas-esque you know it's not really sure yeah there's a bunch of stuff that we like don't implement from pandas and there's a bunch of places where the apis differ and so forth but it's got the flavor of like 
calling methods on a table object. Yeah. So, you know, group by, join. Ibis is very inspired by a, an R library called dplyr. And so we take a lot of the sort of the words and, and verbs and nouns from dplyr, like mutate and select. So that that's that's quite a divergence, I think, from from pandas. I, I'm a fan too, because I that's my other weird like jaunt into like programming that I kind of got into late in life is that I worked in a marketing job and they were like a dual house. They had they hired me on to be like a Python like automation person. Yep. And they had a bunch of R stuff running too. And I was like, Why? Well, I'll I'll learn it. Sure. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> and so I loved the whole concept of the tidyverse. I love the concept of dplyr. And I was able to start writing the sort of connected statement sort of stuff, piping that that made sense in my mind so clearly, yep. especially the stuff that I was working with. And so that's kind of one of those things I think is very interesting that you guys have almost like, where are you coming from? <laughs> Welcome to Ibis. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, that's sort of, that's exactly what we're going for. We're definitely going for like that, that sort of like the piping kind of experience that dplyr has where, I mean, what, yeah. you know, the, like R has the sort of native pipe operator now, but before they used to have just the like percent, you know, angle percent thing. Yeah, it's like a greater than sign or whatever. Right, yeah. right. And so in Python, we already, we have the dot operator, right? And so instead right. of, piping like we have dot and so we're definitely going for that like you know fluent design api where you can just chain stuff and then you build up these big chains and it gets all sort of compiled into sql very heavily uh inspired by dplyr we a lot of we have like pivot wider and pivot longer like so we have a feature called selectors which is 100 percent like stolen like you know <laughs> not stolen i mean right, it wasn't right. like it was anyway inspired by very heavily inspired <laughs> we like i implemented that and when i implemented that i actually ported the test suite from the selectors tests oh, okay. into python so that i could be like this does this behaves like the exact same way in python oh cool yeah yeah i and i was a big fan of the mutate i just like it, it was like such a pain in python to do that at least at the time when i was playing with yep. it and and so I, that was one of those things where like it, it just seemed like a lot of overhead to do something where i'm just and i was working with a lot of text yeah which again pandas talking to wes about it definitely came from like finance if you will right 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 <laughs> and then you know somewhat you know numbers and and uh you know kind of dealing with that stuff and you know hence the back end of numpy and so like text is always kind of like yeah you can do it uh, <laughs> so i kind of uh, appreciate that and it's definitely gotten better and better but it's definitely something that uh, I, I see right away in ibis that it's nice yeah we try to uh i mean i guess one of the different main differences between like the database world and like NumPy comes from like numerical and scientific computing, which right. maybe nowadays is dealing with a lot more strings, but you know, back in the day, strings were kind of an afterthought. Right, right. And like it's coming out of a tradition of of tools like MATLAB, where mm -hmm. very heavily focused on matrix math, uh, you know, everything's an array, et cetera. Optimized for that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and so, but in the database world, like strings have been a thing from day one because yeah, yeah, you know, you, you work for a bank or you work for a law firm, yeah. you look for like these things. Like we're dealing with lots of text, yep, yep, and descriptions of things, and yeah, yeah, and so the, anyway, yeah, we try to do right by the string. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. One of the things that's interesting about this whole process is that, and I don't know where I saw the statement, but I know it's somewhere in the either having talked about it or kind of, uh, you know, discussing it is this idea of getting close to the data as possible. And I feel like, is that something that by kind of recreating these functions and so forth, like this, this functionality of like, you can write these statements, chain them all together, and then it's going to, again, rewrite it and at least process it in a way that it's now like a SQL statement. Is that part of that? Like this idea of like, I want to be able to get in and work with data and Anybody who's worked with SQL for a long time, like having to have an abstraction layer is, is it's always kind of hard as a transition. And I feel like that's something that, you know, you're obviously we talked about three different methodologies of yeah. ways that people can approach it. But is that part of like what you mean by like getting close to the data as possible? Or what, what exactly do you mean by that? Yeah. So getting close to the data is really about making sure that you're 
computing in the most efficient way. Um, okay. So I think traditionally, or, or at least like I've definitely done this in the past where I just ran like pandas dot read SQL. I gave like, I gave it a select star and then yeah. you're, you're like pulling however many, whatever bytes back to your local machine. Right. And now like pandas, you know, you're doing the computation with pandas for better or worse. When we talk about like being close to the data, we're talking about like the computation occurring on the engine sort of that knows how to do that best. So and optimized it already. Exactly. So okay. like let's just like Snowflake, for example. Snowflake is the one that knows how to operate on tables in Snowflake the best, right? So Okay pulling a table back from snowflake and then doing your computation in pandas if it can be expressed in sql is pretty inefficient right you're going to pay egress costs from sure and and yeah so and you know if data if like new data arrives like now you're going to have to pull that back again and anyway it's just it's sort of it becomes both prohibitive in in time space and dollars yeah it's interesting i feel like it, it's a related conversation to you know what's happening with with arrow and the, the idea of like, let's not have to go through a translation layer yeah. each time to to look at this information if we can kind of all agree. And and that's definitely part of this platform also, right? Yep, totally. And 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 the idea, like one of the things that Ibis, it makes it possible to do this because we're just saying, hey, database, like here's the query, like take care of it. Just give me the, just give me the results. Okay. Uh, and so we don't have to, we don't have to pull anything back. We don't need to bring anything into memory until it's like the final result that you asked for. And even then, like you actually have to opt explicitly into doing that by calling a method. Like if like let's say somebody just like pulls but wants to pull back, you know, a billion rows. It's possible with Ibis. You have to kind of like opt into it. You have to call a method that says, like, hey, give me back all the data. This week, I want to shine a spotlight on another RealPython video course. It covers how to create interactive geographic visualizations that you can share as a website. The course is based on a RealPython tutorial by previous guest Martin Royce. It's titled Creating Web Maps from Your Data with Python Folium, and it's presented by video instructor Kimberly Fessel. And she shows you how to create an interactive map using Folium and save it as an HTML file. How to choose from different web map tiles. How to anchor your map to a specific geolocation and bind data to a GeoJSON layer to create a choropleth map. And then how to style that choropleth map. She also shows you how to add points of interest and other features. Learning how to build interactive visualizations is a worthy investment of your time. And sharing standalone web pages is a great way to get your users to understand and dig into the data. And like most of the video courses on Real Python, this course is broken into easily consumable sections. Each lesson has a transcript, including closed captions. And you'll have access to code samples for the techniques shown, in this case, a complete interactive Jupyter notebook. Check out the video course. You can find a link in the show notes, or you can find it using the search tool on realpython.com. So we've kind of dug pretty deep into sort of the functionality and kind of the background of maybe where people are coming from in, in different libraries and so forth. And it's always hard in an audio podcast to, to explain a lot of this stuff. One of the things I think is interesting is you've created this YouTube series, which I don't know if it's Ibis specific, but your series is what? Philip in the Cloud, right? Yep, Philip in the Cloud. <laughs> I lo love the name. It's just because my last name is Cloud. Um, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Apropos for somebody who uh, <laughs> works in data these days. Yeah. Yeah. So what are the types of things that you cover uh, in the, your YouTube channel? Definitely all IBIS right now. Okay. Let's see. So we've covered, we've covered like some integrations with other tools. We've covered various IBIS features. There, I've done a couple of like live, like early early on when I when I started it. Uh, I've done I did a couple like sort of live debugging sessions or like 
I was like, I'll demo this feature. And then it was like, oh, it didn't work in this way for this reason. So I would like sit there and try and figure out what was happening. Okay. That's always uh, interesting. <laughs> yep. Yep. That's, yeah. that's been fun. And then, you know, newer, newer features. Yeah. It's, it's sort of like a, a grab bag of, of IBIS, you know, functionality, news stuff. Okay. Yeah. Mix of stuff. Cool. One of the things I think about, especially with R that I thought was interesting is that it came with, you know, at least some of the basic tools had like example data in it. And, and I feel like IBIS definitely is in the same boat there. Am I thinking of that right? That you have some stuff that people can kind of play around with just the library with a few built-in sort of uh, data points? Or do you have to download those separate? Uh, uh, ish. Like, like it's sort of a mix of yes to all those answers. <laughs> okay. All right. Or to all those questions. We'll, we'll provide links to a guide. <laughs> totally, totally. Yeah. So uh, we have, we have like on our landing page, ibis-project.org, a way that you can, can get started like right away with examples. And it's got a, you know some ru like runnable, like stuff that if you follow the, the sort of one line install, you should be able to copy paste and run that code. We, I forget exactly when we added this, but a while ago we added like an ibis.examples module. Okay. And like we, again, shamelessly stole from R and literally we like have an R script that like pulls the data out from like a few packages and like puts it into like a, a bucket, a cloud bucket. Okay. And so when you call like ibis.examples.penguins.fetch, it's going to pull down that example from the cloud bucket and give you back an ibis expression. Okay. Interesting. So it's kind of a little... A little convoluted, but it it's it's doing the work for you as long as you have the internet connection. Yep, you need an internet connection, and that's only because we didn't want to ship data in our package. Yeah, no, no, it's going to be bigger. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and we have a couple bigger data sets up there as well, like a subset of the IMDB data. Uh, yeah, data, yeah, that's and, the one I've seen. Yeah. That's interesting. And then uh, some of those are in Parquet, I believe, because they're just so much smaller than if they were in okay. like TSV or whatever. But yeah, you can get started with those. We've got a variety of different data sets. We've got sort of the, the R classics like MT cars and Palmer penguins. And yeah. Then we've got some more. We've got some like World of Warcraft data up there as well. Okay. Like gaming data. There's a bunch. Yeah. Yeah, it's nice. It's always fun to kind of get to playing with things that have weight to them that you can kind of actually play around with it's not like uh randomly generate a bunch of numbers for me which i've seen a lot of totally. uh, demonstration stuff and it's like uh, all right my, my eyes are glazing over sorry <laughs> yeah we want people to be able to interact with like a real data set in in like with as little initial friction as possible right so we're not going to hand we're not going to be like oh download this like example three terabyte data set it's like okay like 25 you know it's like 10 percent of the people who use ibis are going to be able to like store that on disk and sure so so we're like we use we like to use the palmer penguins so you know shout out to the the uh, the authors of that paper who have generously provided this data it's like it's like a small data set but it's interesting yeah yeah and then it's got like you know it's got lots of interesting fields exactly yeah. so yeah and there's there's just a it's a it's a rich enough data set that we can say we can demo a lot of features of ibis right using that and then you know when you want to get into some fancier stuff like with arrays and structs like maybe you switch over to imdb data set because you know they've got sort of they've got some stuff where you can yeah process a field into an array and start you know messing around with like a nest and other kind of more advanced uh features of ibis that's definitely a, a database that would have the uh, many to many relationship kind of stuff happening. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. No, it's the and the, the way they encode the relationships is sort of interesting because everything's got a key, but then some of the some of the things that are there's some pre joins that happen. Okay. And I don't I mean, I don't know exactly how that data is generated. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. whatever. <laughs> so, some engineer at IMDB doing it. Um, yeah, I really had to think about it. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah, but there's there's definitely some fields where like I forget. I think it's like roles the the roles that a particular person took on in right in a given movie. Like there's you know that can be like sort of turned into an array, and you can imagine that. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of funny because like yeah, that person could be you know have multiple 
roles in a particular movie. Yeah, it you know, or it could be played yeah. by a different person. Yeah, it's like, oh, there's lots of interesting things. Like exactly, yeah, they're at different ages. Yeah, it's there's a lot of weird stuff to think about, like laying out a database like that. So it, it's just a a fun one to look at to like say, oh, I don't know if I'd model it like exactly like that, but <laughs> yes, yes, and it's also full of. I guess what I would consider like junk, but interesting junk because okay. there's like people's birth dates are like, you know, year 40 or something like that. Like that, it's, it's sort of like stuff that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Oh, okay. Huh. But it's nonetheless interesting to, to poke around and see if you can kind of figure out what went wrong there or guess, you know, it's like <laughs> data, data detective kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That sounds like there's some pretty good resources there. You mentioned the landing page for that are there along with the youtube series where you're kind of doing live demonstrations of working with the library and working with data and trying things out interacting with people yep. uh in that i've seen you've had a few guests also what else would you suggest for somebody who's interested in in checking out the library like what are other resources for them let's see i would say i mean the best resource and we've put a lot of hours into this is, the, is our website, which is also our documentation. Yeah, the API stuff on there is great. Yeah. Yeah, I would also suggest, like, we've also put a, a good amount of effort into getting, like, a GitHub work, like, a working GitHub code space set up so that, like, somebody can, okay. can say, like, create a code space. That'll just, like, put you into a VS Code, you know, a browser, like, VS Code that has, like, all the dependencies installed. You can start running Ibis examples right away directly from oh, the nice. from the shell like you just fire a python copy paste the code from the website and you're off the races nice yeah, maybe we can share some links at the end then yep yeah which i'll definitely include we're also looking to no promises but we're we're potentially looking at like being able to give like a you know an in browser like interactive ibis shell okay. so somebody wouldn't even have to fire up a code space or install anything they could just like run our examples okay. or some of them like in their browser using something like wazi or yeah, yeah. Um, Pyodide, yeah. Um, Pyodide, which okay, is like yeah. the, the the in browser um python interpreter it's it's frankly magic uh, but, <laughs> but it's awesome yeah, yeah we're we're living in in interesting times yeah <laughs> yeah yeah i'm interested in that for lots of reasons i've had uh brett cannon on the show oh nice uh to talk about it and he's been very involved in trying to make it a target you know, yep. for, for Python and I, I'm, you know, I keep kind of watching the space and, and seeing what, what's going to happen next. He'll do these updates and it'll be like, like maybe a quarter of a window of like text, but it's all links. He's like, here, here's where to go look and learn more and so forth. It's not, not narrative at all, right, unfortunately, right. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, there's a lot of work happening there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we mentioned the website, we mentioned YouTube. We said we've got some links for people to experiment and try things out. Um, there's lots of those cool examples that people can kind of try out and we'll download the data for them to to work with. So they don't necessarily have to go and find a bunch of data. Maybe we can talk about, I, I know it's like a laundry list, but maybe we could talk about some of what are the backends that it does support. Like what would be the, and we'd mentioned DuckDB and Postgres and Spark. And I'm trying to remember all the ones we've mentioned so far, but it's quite a few. We actually have like a, a development command to, it's just like, it's called like list, list backends. And literally it's just a line delimited list of them because it changes. And I use it sometimes because this, this does come up from time to time. And I, I want to, yeah. you know, not the one that's always in my mind is DuckDB, of course, because it's the one we use a lot and interact with a lot. But like, right. you know, BigQuery, ClickHouse is one that I think we've got a number of people using. Dask, Data Fusion, Druid. Uh, Exasol, Flink. Nice. We're kind of starting to dabble a bit in the streaming world. Impala, which is sort of like the original backend. That was like the primary backend that Ibis was developed for. Oh, okay. Nice. Microsoft SQL Server, MS SQL, Oracle. A lot of the usual suspects, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we've got a Polar's backend, if you can believe it. Okay. I'm happy to sort of talk about the, the layers there if, if you want. Uh, but there's uh, the PySpark, Snowflake, Trino, SQLite, bunch. Yeah, so we talked about lots of these uh, entry ways into the platform. People that are coming from R mm -hmm. uh, should have a fairly you know friendly experience and you have kind of like a, a guide for them to kind of like 
here's what you should expect. And then you have that was written by an R user. Oh, way. awesome. Great. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> one of our colleagues at Voltron Data wrote that. So you also have, you know, introductions for people that are, you know, much more you know, Python based and then people that are maybe coming from straight SQL. Yep. Those are the three major ones, right? Yep. Yep. I don't think, uh, I don't, I think we're we're thinking about adding one that's like coming from PySpark as well, because I think it's another sort of okay. It's another uh, I think place where people like have spent a lot of time, and so they sure you know, there's like a way to sort of come from that to Ibis. Maybe we can talk a little bit about the project itself. How are you being supported to work on this? Uh, you know, because it, it is an open source yep. tool. Is that entirely through Voltron Data, or is that? through something else. Yep, so Voltron Data is like the primary financial supporter of Ibis. Okay. We have, oh, I, I've lost count. It's not that many, I just don't remember. Okay. <laughs> uh, but there's, I think, six or seven full-time people working on different different aspects of Ibis. And then we've got a few people from outside of Ibis that contribute. We've got a person from Google, We've got a person who is just a very enthusiastic user who we recently like made into a committer. Um, okay. And so it's sort of at its core, like supported by Voltron data. And then we have a number of, like, we're trying to grow like the developer community. And so we want to, yeah, yeah. We want to bring in some people, you know, from outside Voltron data who are, who are interested in, in contributing, especially for like for backends that, you know, some of us may not know a lot about. Yeah, I can imagine that can be tricky depending on, you know, <laughs> the history of the back end. And... There, there's just one of the, like, unique uh, sort of development, uh, let's call it experiences that one may have when working <laughs> on Ibis is having to deal with the idiosyncrasies of 20 execution engines. Um, okay. Especially around all the... yeah fun, but not really that fun edge cases of, you know, null handling and... Yeah, there's just a lot of different stuff there, you know, how they happen to do floating point rounding, right? I mean, that's like, that differs among oh, yeah, okay. each of these. Uh, there's, uh, anyway, there's a lot of interesting details there, but yeah, it can be quite tiring to, at the end, you end up with, you know, some knowledge about how 20 systems work, but you're like, where where am I going to use this except for Ibis, right? I mean, <laughs> except if, I'm, if I'm an Ibis developer, I, uh, it's useful. Yeah. You know, hardly anyone has. 20 unique databases in production. So I have a kind of an odd duck question that I, I wondered about, and I, I didn't dig deep into the documentation, but you talk about this idea of it taking what you've written and it generating the SQL that then is used on that back end. Is there a way to have it output it also, like as that actual SQL query? Absolutely. Okay. Um, yeah. Great. So... There's a couple ways that you can do that. We we have this top level function that's like ibis dot okay. two underscore SQL. You give it an ibis expression and optionally a dialect that you want it to generate. Okay, and it gives you back uh, a SQL string. And nice. Okay, if you're if you're in IPython or a Jupyter notebook, it will actually syntax highlight that output. For oh, you. nice. And you can see it, uh, you know, in a little bit more readable way. Yeah. So yet adding on to the portability yep um and the idea yeah so the idea with that is you can get something that can be used as a sql string but then like if you just want to like look at your sql you also get the syntax highlighted thing you can you turn it to whatever dialect the uh, you know ibis supports i think that is a maybe a form of de debugging too potentially oh we we all 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 of us ibis developers use it all the time in that way <laughs> okay yeah cool uh, we also have like a, a compile method so the the two sql one is like uh, in some ways it's like it's like very sort of aesthetics focused right it's gonna like okay do like pretty printing of the sql it'll like indent it and all this stuff sure the compile method's like a little bit more raw it doesn't do any pretty printing it's just it's okay. it's not very readable <laughs> but if like you want to get exactly what's going to the database that's what you would you would print out i guess a little bit like how uh whatever css files or uh, html files could be like all space removed you know kind of right it's not quite that yeah. level of um of craziness yeah. like where you're where you're you know like javascript minification it's not at that level yeah, minification, of, that's it yeah <laughs> of insanity but uh it's like it's like you know uh towards that direction yeah, yeah. cool 
Philip, I have these questions I like to ask everybody who comes on the show. And the first one is, what's something that you're excited about that's happening in the world of Python? There's a few things. Okay. So I know PyDi is not particularly new, but I am definitely just very interested in that. I'm excited about where it's heading. And yeah, yeah. I know um, Peter Wang from, from Anaconda has, uh, has, he, have you, has he been on the show? I invited him literally moments after he walked off the stage at PyCon okay. and we still have yet to connect. Okay. And so I got to try again. So <laughs> yeah, he's, he's awesome. Yeah. Char- uh, character, hilarious guy. Anyway, I know he was like a long time ago. He's like, why can't we run Python in the browser? And then whatever, fast forward a decade or two. And now you can. So that's pretty exciting to me. SQL glot somewhat biased there just because we're heavy users of it. No, no, it's helping you guys out. <laughs> it's a pretty exciting project. I think I think a lot of us working on Ibis were like, it would be great if like we didn't have to write all this translation sure. layer and like somebody else would do it. And uh and somebody else did. Nice. Independently of us, you know, trying to conjole or anything like that. It just it showed up one day and we were like, wow, this is really this is something. Like, this is great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's cool. PyCon US is coming up. I think a bunch of the Ibis team are going to be there. We're giving a tutorial. Nice. Some of us are giving a talk in Spanish at the Charlas. Yeah, yeah. It's track. One of my uh, coworkers is very involved in that. Okay, and, nice. Uh, yeah, so that's great. And then, as usual, there's always some exciting new stuff in the world of Python package management, like UV and Pixie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> something to watch. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I've spent a lot of time working on package management tools in various capacities, um, okay. either like for an application at a job or just like working with complex development environments, you can imagine Ibis has a lot of optional dependencies. And, yeah, yeah. And so, like, we need environments. Should I have you back on to do a survey with me? Maybe we can bring a, a handful of people in. We can talk about oh, it. Oh, man. I think that would just <laughs> erupt in, like, I don't know, like, violence or something. Because package <laughs> management is just, it's just that kind of topic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's very, very uh, opinionated, uh, very much so, yeah. <laughs> so, but, like... I, I see things like UV, and I've have you had Charlie Marsh on the on the show? No, no, I'm um, he's somebody else who's on the list that I'm, I've been um, thinking about. I've been kind of watching rough to yep. him forming the company, and that's been interesting to kind of watch too because it's just sort of a similar journey of a few other. I don't want to call them smaller, but like individuals who said, "I want to make a company, and let's turn this into a thing," and and that's hard. Totally. <laughs> so I wonder what the struggles are there. I might actually approach it from that angle too yeah no charlie's great you should talk to him for sure um and then pixie which is is like a, a it's like an you know an analogous sort of tool but working you know more right. closely with the conda ecosystem yeah yeah and if you if you don't know wolf volprex uh, i mean i'm happy to put you in touch yeah yeah and the mamba and all that stuff yeah yeah i'm sure he, he would be a good person to talk to as well. So like I'm I'm kind of watching both those tools to see where things go. I I mean I think the Python community has had some struggles with various like standards around package management and just trying to get yeah, yeah. some consensus and coalescing on various things and it's such a wide target to hit. Very. Yep. So that's the problem. It's used in so many different fields and all these different backgrounds and you literally have the immediate division of data science and, and you know, everything happening with Anaconda and, yep. you know, Conda and all that sort of stuff. So versus PIP. Yeah. And I think one of the, like, these tools are coming from a few decades of learning what is good, what works and what doesn't work. And so right. they have the benefit of the hindsight of all the things that we wish we could change, but that we can't change. And so like a you know, programming language like Rust comes along and Cargo and people are like, oh my God, like this is right. really how the thing should be. But they can stand on those shoulders, man. Right. And so and so like tools like UV and Pixie like have all that history to uh to build on, which I think, you know, somewhat speaks to their ability to succeed. Yeah, yeah. So uh yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. That's a whole bunch of stuff. I will definitely add links for uh, all those items and 
I'm very interested in when people suggest guests because uh, I'm always looking to add more people to the roster. So for sure. What's something that you want to learn next? Again, this doesn't have to be about programming. Right now, I'm currently learning Spanish. Okay. I live with two native speakers, and one doesn't speak English, and so I'm I'm just trying to go like you know as deep as possible as I can there. Okay, it's an immersion. <laughs> yep, yep, and uh, I'm yeah. yeah, it's it's sort of it's it's tough, but it's like it's very rewarding, and I, I'm. I'm using a platform called LearnCraft Spanish, which takes a different approach than other attempts that I've made. Okay. I think a lot of like a lot of the a lot of these sort of app based things. Right, right. The Duolingos and such. Yeah, they don't give you they don't focus on fundamentals like grammar. They focus a lot on vocabulary. So like how do I say dog right. and milk and whatever? Right, right. And they can have these pretty little icons and so forth to to trigger you yeah they kind of designed to like keep you in the app and and you know, i don't know i mean i'm i, I don't want to say anything like super negative but no no it's it's almost the same complaint people have about tutorials in the python world it's like maybe you should go build something you know maybe you should go have an actual conversation yeah <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> it, it's yeah. kind of like a different approach yeah and it's what like learn craft spanish takes a, a very different approach in that they teach you a lot of the hardest grammar first so also, just I didn't know a lot of the names for grammatical ing- like constructs, right? So like things like direct sure, sure. object pronouns and so forth. Right. I didn't, you know, uh, if somebody said, "Hey, what's a direct object pronoun in English?" I'd be like, "Yeah, I don't know." <laughs> now I can tell you, but it's only because I learned it in the context of learning Spanish. So right, right. So like, yeah, getting into that stuff and getting into the harder stuff first is like a lot more rewarding because you can build the the tools you need to ask for the vocabulary, right? That's that's sort of the end goal. It's like, well, if you just need to know how to say table, then like you can just describe the table. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's cool. That sounds really a, an interesting way of pr- approaching it. Are you... Yeah, so... Because you mentioned the PyCon talk. Are, are yep. you involved in that then? Trying to do uh, some of it in Spanish or no? Yes, I am. And, okay. you know, TBD on how well that's going to go. Um, <laughs> All right, I want to hold your feet to the fire. <laughs> my colleague, who is a native Spanish speaker, uh, will be sort of yeah. leading the charge on that. And, you know, hopefully uh, yeah, yeah. she's not going to ask me to say anything complicated. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. That's fun. What's the best way that people can follow the work that you do online? GitHub, hands down. Um, I don't. I do a little bit of tweeting, but mostly it's a joke. Uh, like the things I say are not that serious, right? Um, That's not your your serious networking tool. Yeah, as the it last, is for lots of other last, people. Yeah, the last major thing I did on Twitter was an April Fool's joke related to Ibis. So, okay. um, you know, don't take that. <laughs> right. Don't take that. Uh, those interactions, I guess, too seriously. Yeah. Uh, but I. I definitely spend most of my like online sort of work time on GitHub. Yeah, yeah. You were a, a true convert after your first experiences there <laughs> that we discussed. <laughs> yep, yep. I I uh, been on GitHub for a long time. Yeah, that's great. Well, Philip, it's fantastic to talk to you. Thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks, Christopher. Thanks for inviting me. Glad we got to chat. And don't forget, this episode was brought to you by MailTrap an email delivery platform that developers love. Try it out for free at mailtrap.io. I want to thank Philip Cloud for coming on the show this week. And I want to thank you for listening to the Real Python podcast. Make sure that you click that follow button in your podcast player. And if you see a subscribe button somewhere, remember that the Real Python podcast is free. If you like the show, please leave us a review. You can find show notes with links to all the topics we spoke about inside your podcast player or at realpython.com slash podcast. And while you're there, you can leave us a question or a topic idea. I've been your host, Christopher Bailey, and I look forward to talking to you soon.